something nice and fluffy this morning before we have a little supper. As you know, that's the way we roll around here. Proverbs 29, please. Proverbs 29. I preached this once before about seven years ago, I believe. I usually write the dates on them. Make sure I don't recycle them through too much. Uh, you have probably heard this verse more than once, particularly when it comes to uh, church building, <laughs> church planning, or missionaries. And I'm not mocking that. Well, not all of it. Some of it is, is mockable. But 29.18 says this, Where there is no vision, the people perish. He that keeps the law, happy is he. Now go over me to Revelation chapter 3. I believe we're in the Laodicean church age. I believe that. I believe we're in the last segment, last portion of God's dealing with the church age before the Lord comes in the clouds to get us up out of here. I believe Philadelphia is probably the greatest church age. Philadelphia gave you your King James Bible, gave you the preponderance of great preachers that went all over the world to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now, Laodicea it kind of started out okay, but, you know, late 1800s, you got, you know, Westcott and Court, goofy Bible verse, you got the Mormons starting up, Jehovah's Jehovah's Witnesses and all that stuff. And then you hit 1901, ASV, and you get all kinds of crazy stuff. And now, you are where you are in 2022. You're right in downtown Laodicea, man. But if you remember what we just read, where there's no vision, the people perish. Look at one of the things that God condemns this church in Laodicea for. Look at the Bible says in 3, verse number 14. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen. I like that name about the Lord Jesus Christ. The faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. That's not the first thing that God made. It means that nothing starts getting made without Jesus Christ because he's eternal. So go take your watchtower and go start a fire with it. Oh, that's why you guys don't believe in fire, so go do whatever you want with it. Fifteen. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Cold or hot. Does anybody know what Laodicea means? What does the word Laodicea mean? It's the age of the people's rights, the people's voice. Uh, God has no rights. The people have all the rights. People have all the voice. What do you think today? What are you thinking? What do you think? I don't care what you think. I care what thus saith the Lord. Right. I care what the King James Bible says. Well, how do you feel, brother? What's your version say? What's for music today? What? I don't care. What's the book say? You're narrow-minded. I absolutely am. I'm as narrow as God told me to be in that book. Bible goes on to say, like, we're just, just we're getting woke up, man. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I smell the food. I'm freaking out. The <laughs> Bible says this, verse number 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, look at what they say. Look what the people say, because with the people's voice. I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Huh. Well, walking to the average church today, that's exactly the exalted position they take, just like their old father, the devil. Who knows not that thou art wretched and miserable. And poor and bluffing and naked. I constantly buy of me gold, trying to find that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And look at this, and anoint thy eyes with eye set that thou mayest see. What do the Laodicean church people believe? We see everything. We understand all of it. We have perfect wisdom. There's nothing. We, we, we don't need your help, Lord. But Jesus Christ, the great doctor of the whole universe, says, I'm telling you, you need to counsel and take my counsel and go get some eye salve. Because you don't see. You're actually blind. And where there's no vision, the people perish. There we go. Go on with me. Let's finish this chapter and we'll uh, finish chapter and then we'll get to it. Verse number 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chase if he's else that will repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And he with me. It's not that the Lord won't come in. Nobody's opening the door. That's right. You had the church of the open door in Philadelphia. Now you have the church of the closed door. He's in the midst of the church in Philadelphia. He's on the outside trying to get in this one. Folks, if the Lord don't get in this church, we're hosed. Mm -hmm. The Bible goes on to say this in verse number 21. To him that overcome it, will I grant, sit with me in my throne, even as I also came and sat down on my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, I hope you have one this morning. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Thank you, Father, again for the opportunity to be around your word and preach your word. It is your book. It's a holy book, and it's a spirit of God-given book. And I pray today, as you just gave to us, Father, in that last verse, let us, through the Spirit of God, hear what you have to say to us. Father, please give us believing hearts and obedient feet. Help us not to think about the things that come in the next few minutes. 
know, what the Lord's Supper and all that helps us focus on this time we have around your book. Father, please feed us and chasten us and rebuke us and love us and comfort us as only you can through the preaching and teaching and instruction of your word. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the two years we've had, Father. I pray we'd have many more until you see fit to shut it down and we move on and do something else for you. Father, help us not to quit. Help me not to quit. You never quit on me and you never will. I thank you, Father, again in Christ's name. Amen. As we just read with our companion verse over 2918 of Proverbs, one of the things wrong with the Laodicean church age is they have a more lofty belief of what they have and their abilities and talents, and the Lord has to come in and correct them and say, you guys better repent, but as you do that, you need to take my counsel and you are blind, though you think you see. And never have you been in an age right now where everybody thinks they know everything. Uh, you know what? Uh, I can look it up on my phone. How about I take your phone and I smash it, and then we'll see how smart you are. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. Everybody thinks they're so smart because they can Google it. Now, I appreciate Brother James had a question about what the Jasper Stone looked like in between uh, Sunday school. And I said, I thought it was like, you know, like off-white or yellowish, and, you know, what's Brother James do? That's pretty cool, but I should have known of it. And it is, it is partially yellow with some red, red flecks in it, but I should have known that, you know what? Because I read books, I like to read books. I don't like the phone, man. The phone's a convenient thing, but other than that, it's a waste of time. But the point being is that we think we see now. We think we know everything about, you know, creation, and we know everything about society and that rights and all that stuff. The Lord says, now let's focus right now on you and I and save people, the church. We don't see as we ought to see. Uh, if there's anything we need nowadays, we need spiritual eyes. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to see and discern what that book says to the power of the Spirit of God as to the temperature of the age. I remember reading a book, and I've heard preachers say it before, is that the duty of every Christian is to find out the temperature and spirit of the age and go exactly 180 degrees away from it. And the spirit of this age is self-will and self-worth and look at me and pride and I'm the best and I don't care. And, and God says, you need to do a 180 from that. I'm talking to save people right now. Yeah, right. You know what the danger is? You think you see things, but you're blinded than a bat flying backwards in a snowstorm. <laughs> that just sounded good. I have no idea. I've never seen it happen. It probably never will happen. But it's just cool to say that because you're all spellbound right here. But the bottom line is this is that we think we see. Well, I hope to God that as we go through this, we'll take the Lord's counsel. We'll get some eye salve today. Didn't he tell you to get some eye salve? Nope. You know, there's nothing like Neosporin when you got a cut, man. And it's starting to get affected. Put a little Neosporin in there, seal it up, and the thing gets better. I, I, I'm not saying that's what I do. I actually pick it open further, and it just, you know, more. As we don't like to tell the guys in jail, do you guys enjoy cutting your hand and then taking a hammer to it? And some of the guys actually had to think for a minute and go, I wonder if we really do or not. We do in our family. We like more. But the Lord said, you need to go get some eye salve. So I hope through the preaching of the Word of God and you show you some examples of the Word of God that you will get some eye salve this morning so you can see the way your Savior sees, not the way you want to see, not the way I want to see. This is not a church's doctrine. It's the Bible doctrine. You know what? In going through this, now Taylor's had some issues in the last few weeks and she's noticed that she has, you know, talking about the eyes in general, that over here it's gotten kind of kind of dark where her peripheral vision goes in and out. And it's frequent when you start losing your vision. Mm -hmm. I think of all the senses to lose. Now, hearing people, my wife and I have, we don't argue, well, yeah, we do. But, I mean, I think, I think losing your hearing would be the worst. I mean, you're probably wishing you lost your hearing right now. But, I mean, but seeing, losing your seeing would be horrible. And losing your sight would be terrible. It'd probably be a little bit better if you had grown up having your sight, where you could kind of get an idea of, you know, brick and tree and animals, stuff like that. But all, all kidding aside, if you're born blind, you never really got a chance to see. And you, you're trying to talk to a blind person, say, well, this is, and they're like, see what, and you're like, oh, no, they don't see, man. They don't see. I hate these things. But you know what's showing me? My physical eyes are getting worse. I remember getting up in the pulpit reading uh, Brother Tim Benson had me read a passage, which we would do sometimes down at First Bible Plainville. And I remember one day getting up there and I'm like, read, I think, I don't know if we went to Jose. No, we're in Obadiah. I said, we're going we're gonna to read three books of the Bible today. And everybody's like, ah. So I took him to 2 John, 3 John, and Obadiah. I'm like, hey, let's knock them all out. But I remember going to Obadiah. I'm like, I don't know. And Karen's like, 
he missed a couple words, of course, Herb Cox, so goes, hey, he missed a whole line, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> shut up, <laughs> shut up, go, go to Ledger, get away from me. <laughs> but anyway, you know what helps these things right here, man? You're going to say, well, why? Because my eyesight is waiting. Well, spiritually speaking, you don't want your eyesight to go bad. You want to see things exactly the way the Lord sees them. And you're not going to get them all down here because we see through a glass darkly. But it'd be good to get some eye salve to help out for those fuzzies and the no peripheral vision. Doesn't he say that you're supposed to walk what? Circumspect. As a good soldier, you want to keep an eye out every way around you, 360 men. You want to know what's going on right off. You want to, more so for you and I in the Laosian church age, we think we see everything. We think we know it. I, I know that already. I, I know that preacher. And the Lord's like, you don't see anything like you're supposed yeah. to see. You need to get some eye staff, son, and put it in your eyes, like that Neo Sworn in the cut. Well, look, the Bible says when you go back, we'll, we'll take a look at the first guy here. Go to uh, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 3. 1 Samuel 3. 1 Samuel 3. I think this will all run together pretty well in your Bible, not because I did it, but because I believe the Lord put it together as He does through His book. You say, where do you come up with this stuff? Holy Bible. Brian, put it to use. God will do it for anybody. When these guys got to preach this afternoon, they'll look at them and go, wow, that's just not very good. It's, you're not seeing things. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't know anything. And you do. You yeah. think you see more than they do? You don't know what's going on. You see, that, that comes from somebody who thinks he knows it all. And that's why you get to sit in the chair for 20, 30 years. 1 Samuel 3. And the child Samuel ministered, verse number 1, of the Lord before Eli. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. Look at this. There was no open vision. <laughs> what a great, what a great way to start off this message. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place that his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And there the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep that the Lord... Uh, and, and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of, uh, ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I call not. Lie down, kid. Go get a drink of water. Go lay down, kid. Go back to sleep. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, thou shalt speak. Uh, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant here. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood. He called it as at other times, Samuel, to Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant here. Did you see the first one here right here? <laughs> this man, this high priest, his name is Eli. The Bible says his eyes start to go dim that he can't see. And what's the next thing that happens because he can't see? The lamp of God goes out. First thing i like to say this morning is what you may be blind to is you lost the Holy Ghost power in your life. You know, the lamp is a picture of the light in that in that tabernacle, in that big tent, and the lamp is on east, west, north side. It's on the south side of town. The bread's on the, uh, on the north side of town. And that lamp gives light to the bread. And that lamp is filled with oil. And that oil was supposed to be there continually. And what Eli made a mistake with and erred greatly is that he let the lamp grow and go dry. You know why? Because he lost his spiritual vision. I, I know it's physical, but we're making an application for it. His eyes go dim, and what happens? The lamp goes out. Well, if you don't pay attention in your life, you don't have a little eye. You might be blind today to the fact that the Holy Ghost of God has no power in your life or no sway in your life at all. You say, well, I know I'm sealed in the day of redemption. You are. Praise the Lord. I'm talking about the daily Holy Ghost power that allows you to live the life God's called you to live after he saved you. The Holy Ghost isn't just good for saving you folks and sealing you. It's good for sanctification. That's what it's supposed to be for. And when the lamp goes out, it's because your eyes go dim and you can't see anymore. You're like, I don't know, is the Holy Ghost still around me? I don't know. You say, that's crazy. No, over in Acts chapter 16, when those boys, Paul has a plan. Paul wants to go to Phrygia and Pamphylia and all those places. And Paul says, this is what we want to do. Now, I think Paul's a pretty spiritual guy. 
In fact, I know he's a spiritual guy. He says at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, he goes, and I think I have the spirit of God. Well, if anybody ever had it, it was him. But you know what happens in Acts 16? The Holy Ghost interrupts Paul's life and says, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go to Macedonia. Has the Holy Ghost ever said that to you before? I don't want you to take that job. I want you to take this job. Because you'll be a better witness and testimony. Yeah, but I make $3 more an hour over here. Yeah, but it'll be better for me, for you to go there, and the Spirit of God's telling you to go there. Yeah, but I want to go over here. You're blind. Your eyesight's waning. You're getting dim, brother. You're getting dim, sister. Well, I'll just go witness to everybody. Now, I know there's a principle. We do go out in public. We try. But there are certain people in that crowd that you know God has put his finger on for you to go walk towards, and you feel it every time. It's not your feeling, it's God moving you. That's the Spirit of God. No, I don't want to do that. No, I'm not going to do that. Do you, do you think the Holy Ghost voice gets brighter and more vocal when you deny Him? Or does it become smaller and smaller? Yeah, because you keep feeding the flesh. You're blind, man. Eyes are getting dim. Your lamp's going out. You don't have the whole... I didn't say you don't have the Holy Ghost. You're saved forever. But you've lost the power of God in your life. To discern even simple things like good and evil. Where to go, where not to go. That's what happened to Eli. Eli's eyes with him, he's losing his eyesight and the lamp goes out. Look with me over, I'll show you a couple of these. Go with me to, uh, go with me to 1 Corinthians. Actually, on the way there, go to Luke 9. I'm sorry, on the way to 1 Corinthians, go to Luke 9. Do you remember a man named Samson? Mm. Samson's a pretty, I mean, who can rip a gate off and carry it like eight, nine miles up a hill, man? First of all, how are you going to catch a fox? How are you going to catch one fox? He catches hundreds of foxes, puts their tails together, puts a, a brand between them, lights on fire, and lets them go loose to the cornfields of the Philistines. That's the greatest Halloween prank ever. We did some stuff in New Hampshire in the M80s that I'm never going to get on YouTube. You never know, even it doesn't exist. But there's some things, probably jail time's waiting for us out there. Bill Cracky and the chicken farmer and a few others. But I'm just saying, that's the greatest trick ever done. But let me ask you a question. Samson Strongman, Gate, Samson Foxes, Samson. Every time, up and at him, Samson. Up and at him, here they come. And then one time, he gets up from the bosom of iniquity named Delilah. Samson, Phil seems to hear. I'll whip him like I always do. Put 450 on there. Let's go right now. Yeah. The Bible says he was not the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. Mm -hmm. He didn't even know God had left him. I know, no, no, don't sit there and look at me all cross-eyed, man. I know you're, you're getting all crazy. I know God ain't going to leave you. You already know we know that and believe that from New Testament doctrine. I'm talking about the power of the Spirit of God here. And you don't see it because you're blind to it. And you just keep trudging through life and trudging through life and trudging through life. Oh, yeah, walk in the Spirit, brother. Yeah. Have you ever walked in the Spirit? Have you ever tried to walk in the Spirit? Have you ever attempted to do it? If you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if you continue to fulfill the, fulfill the lust of the flesh, what are you not doing? Walking in the Spirit, you're blind. Luke 9. It's a position I don't want to be in. I would hate to be physically blind, but you know what? I don't want to be spiritually blind. I don't want to be spiritually I don't want to pick up my Bible and go... What's, yeah, what's the big deal? Oh, church, he's going to yell at us for an hour again. Verse 51 says this, And it came to pass when the time has come that he, should, uh, that he should be received up and steadfast and set his face to go to Jerusalem and send messengers before his face. And they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they, that the Samaritans, did not receive him because his face was as though he would go, uh, go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we uh, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Uh, I'm laughing because I thought that too often. But he said, This is Jesus Christ. And uh, but he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. What, would you not say James and John are pretty spiritual guys? When they're, folks, they're in the inner three. Peter, James, and John. Every once in a while, Andrew gets in there. But it's pretty much Peter, James, John. Peter, James, John. That's all there is. Wouldn't you say those two men had a walk with the Lord physically and really? 
Then <clears throat> all of a sudden, boy, the Samaritans said, you're not going to come this way and we see your face? You're going to Jerusalem? Well, okay, well, just don't even come around here. And James and I go, Lord, did you hear what they said about you? Did you hear what they said? Do you, 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 you want us? They're talking to the God of the universe who controls lightning and fire and thunder. And they're like, would you want, Lord, would you like us to call down fire from heaven? What are you going to ask me to do? Because I'm the one that controls that element? You don't know what spirit you're of. You're blind. You're blind. I didn't come to destroy men's lives. I came to save. But you lose your eyesight about that. Now, I, one of my favorite stories, Brother Bird knows this, a few others know this. One of my favorite gospel accounts and stories, I hate the word story, but I, I can deal with it, uh, is the man that gets healed by the Lord of his blindness. And he gets, the, he gets healed by the Lord, and he sees, I see men as trees. And the Lord has to touch them a second time so he can see men as they really are. The Lord needs to touch some of you today in your eyes so you'll start to see men as souls. Not just your buddies, not just your family members. Folks, if you have family members that are not saved, you need to be begging God that you get a chance to witness to them. You know what the first thing of my children's lives are? That they would have got redeemed. Oh, I wonder what college you're going to. I want to have a good career. Will they play sports? No. Are they going to get saved? Who cares? If they have a degree from MIT, who cares they make 150 grand a year and they die and go to hell? Right. But if you don't see that because you're blind, you won't even care about it. You'll be like, let's just call fire down. Who cares? This is not all this, this. You need some eyes to this morning because you're not seeing things the way the Lord sees them. And if you're not in that book, you certainly will never see what he sees and how he sees it. Those boys didn't understand it. They thought, folks, they're invoking 1 Kings 17 and 18. They're invoking Bible to the one that wrote the Bible to destroy people. And the Lord's like, do you even see what you're saying? Do you even get what you're doing? What are you doing, man? Well, that's like you and I. I, I man, I hope Nancy Pelosi dies. I, I hope Joe Biden has a uh, seat really goes to hell. I, I bring that up so it's so personal to this, this modern age of Christianity where we care about who's in office and who does what. Yeah. No, I care for men's souls because that's what we're in the game of. You're either saved or you're lost. Help the saved grow in the knowledge and uh, uh, grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and help the saved to see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all there is, folks. Yeah. But if you're blind, the spirits that can't see, <laughs> who cares, man? Who cares? There's tracks on the back table, you know. Do you know those gospel tracts at the back table? Mm -hmm. If you don't have them on your own, take some gospel tracts with you, hand them out to somebody. Mm -hmm. That's part of having the spiritual eyesight. You see them as they really are. I'll show you another one about 1 Corinthians 2. I'm not going to be labor these. I know it's funny coming for me, but I'm really not going to. 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. First thing is you lose the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. First Corinthians 2. Look at verse number 5 with me, folks. Actually, no, i got to go to verse number 1. First Tim uh, I'm, did I say First Timothy just by mistake? First, I, I hope I didn't. First Corinthians 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, by a demonstration of the spirit of power. Who cares how eloquent you are if Jesus Christ is not in your message? Right. Who cares how many points you got and how many nice poems you got in illustrations? If the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and the power is not there, who cares? Sit down, shut up, and get somebody up here that can yeah. have some contact with the Spirit of God. They can minister to me. It's not the volume of the voice. It's not that. It's, it's the Spirit of God working through that man. It's the Spirit of God working through you as a hearer that you'll hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says in the church. He's talking to you right now about your eyes. Sir. Number one about a Holy Ghost filled and power. Why? Look at the Bible goes on to say with me. Verse number five. That your faith should not stand the wisdom of men, but the power of God. I like a lot of really good preachers. I, I listen to a lot of really good preachers. But sometimes we get transfixed by the preacher and his intellect, and not by the power of the Spirit of God working through that man. That's where the power is. I don't want to put 
faith and trust in, in the, the preachers I like to be. I want to put faith and trust in the Spirit of God that's inside that man, that he's yielded to that, so he'd preach what God would have me to hear. I don't want to hear, oh, well, you know, I have all these all these S's I know we get around, all these T's. What is God a thesaurus? That's weird, man, to me. That's just weird. How about you get up there and preach what God have you preach, and let God deal with the people that are sitting listening to him. Mm -hmm. That's part of the blindness in this regard is I'll just get up and preach like I'm always preaching. Who, who really, you know, I don't, it don't, if God don't get in that message, who cares what you've got written down? Mm -hmm. Go on me. The Bible says this. Verse number uh Verse number six. How may we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor are the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained for the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not crucify the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered the heart of man the things of God prepared for them to love. And that sounds great, but look at what the next verse says. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit serves all things, yea, the deep things of God. You want to know what heaven's like? Get in prayer for about an hour or two. Let the Spirit of God control your life. You want to know what being in, in glory is? The Spirit has revealed them to you, the deep things of God. Look what the Bible goes on to say. For what man knoweth the things of a man, say the Spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of uh, God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Folks, there's three major spirits that control you, that control this whole world, this whole life. The spirit of the world, which is profoundly through the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2. The spirit of man that you're born with, the natural spirit you have. And then the spirit of God when you got saved. That's what's going to control your life as a saved person. Don't blame it on the lost. Blame it on yourself for not yielding to the spirit of God. You know who's controlling your life right now in your mind and your thoughts? It's either you the devil or the spirit of God. Oh, the devil can't control me. Oh, but you'd be shocked. Give him an inch, he becomes a ruler. Mm. Be careful. Your old dad still likes visiting rights. Your old dad still likes to visit the kids on the weekend. Your old father's the devil, but don't tell me he don't come around and just throw some little goodies at you that you used to like to do. He knows you better than you know yourself. But on top of that, my own self is horrific. Left to myself, are you serious? But thank God for the Spirit of God that dwells inside us that are saved. Mm -hmm. I don't have to walk after the flesh. I don't have to yield to the flesh. Neither do you. First thing is, you've got to be careful. You're blind to the fact when your eyes become dim that you've lost the power of the Holy Ghost. Go on with me to Genesis 27. Genesis 27. Genesis 27. Genesis 27, verse number 1. Please. Genesis 27, verse number 1 says this. I'll let you get there. Genesis 27, verse 1. Genesis 27, 1. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, said he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son, he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old, I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field, and take me some venison, and make me savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah heard, and Isaac spake to Esau his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison to bring it. I'd like to say this. When you start losing your spiritual eyesight, and your eyes become dim, and you become blind to the things of God, you start loving God and seeking after and pursuing earthly, temporary things. I'm not saying there's anything with Isaac. He basically wants his last meal from his buddy, the hunter man. I mean, Esau ran the local, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bass, uh, Bass uh, Pro Shop. He's the guy that, you know, you come in there, you want a rifle, and Esau would be right there all hairy and all red, maybe like, yeah, man, take the Winchester. Stuff like that. I mean, he, he's a man's man. Jacob was more like playing with the little Barbie dolls and stuff. He's maybe the first transgender. We don't really know yet. But Jacob was kind of a softy. But his mom loved him. So a mommy's boy was, you know, I kind of was because I needed protection because I was so small and frail from my brothers. And I'm a baby. They used to beat me. I'm psychologically taking out everybody else now. No. But I'm just saying, is that, but Jacob was a mommy's boy. Esau was daddy's son. 
you know, he always won the punt pass and kick tournament, won all the trophies. He always brought back the, you know, the uh, the big buck with all the points on it, the 12-point buck and all that stuff. He's a man's man. And I'm not condemning Isaac for saying, you know what, I'm not going to die. I want to have my last meal provided by my son. I, I think that would be awesome. But what happens is, in this whole thing, Rebecca's in the background, and what does she do that turns the whole thing on end? She connives and schemes this whole thing with the conniver Jacob. And this whole thing goes down. You know why? It started, Isaac got his eyes off the main thing. I'm about to die and to go be with my fathers. And though there's nothing inherently wrong with having the venison and the savory meat, it points to me in my own personal life is that you start getting dim in your eyes and blind to seeing that maybe I love this world too much. Maybe I love the, you know, isn't there a song, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. What are we studying tonight? Guys going, eyes going dim and they can't see. I, the closer I get to the Lord, the more this world is supposed to be at arm's length for me, so the things of this world become dim. I'm not talking about creation. I'm not talking about the animals. I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about the way the world thinks. Yep. The way the world promotes itself. Yep. The way the world that says, get all you can get because that's all you're going to get. The bumper sticker on the back, he who dies with the most toys wins. No, he who dies with Jesus Christ wins. Yep. All that nonsense you see propagated on TV and, and I, all, all this. Listen, as a child of God, I am not to get involved with that stuff. Folks, light and darkness don't get along to you. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care how you parse it, how you shade it. We are children of light, and God said, you know what? Come out from all and be separate. Folks, without going there, do you remember what happened to Demas? Brother Bird mentioned last week, we mentioned it several times, and we like to look at Demas like that could never happen to us. Do you know Demas was a faithful servant in Colossians 4 and in Philemon, which you've been studying in Sunday school? Yo, Demas was right there with the Apostle Paul. Then all of a sudden, in 2 Timothy 4, what happens to him? Loveless. Loveless. He loved this what? He loved the present world. What happened to that boy? I keep mentioning it because it's worth mentioning. You don't go prodigal just in an instant. You've been going prodigal for years. And then when the last straw hits that camel's back, you're gone. You're gone with the Lord. You're gone with other Christians. You're done with your Bible. You're done with praying. You're, listen, you've been going prodigal for years. And then finally, you got your excuse. I'm out. They did me wrong. I'm not going to you got a problem with the Lord. You know what? You're blind. You're spiritually blind. But you won't hate yourself. It's everybody else. You have perfect eyesight for everybody else, but you don't have any eyesight for you going blind. Everybody else is wrong. Everybody else is the problem. And I, no, maybe you're starting to love this world too much. And church is not that important to you, and the Bible's not that important to you, and witness ain't that important to you. Because you know what? Secretly in your heart, you wouldn't tell us to anybody. You want to go back. You want to go back to where you were in Egypt. Folks, that's what it says in Acts 7. They turned in their heart back to Egypt before they even started saying leeks and cucumbers and all that. You, you start in your heart going back to Egypt. Saved, washed in the blood, eternally secure, but you're losing your eyesight because you still think those temporary things can bring you pleasure more than Jesus Christ. And it never, you know what? You end up miserable and you keep testing it and trying it, testing it and trying it. And you know it always ends in the same misery. You know what Moses said? He forsook the pleasures of Egypt and the riches of Egypt. Why? Because their approach to Christ were far better. That man had everything at his disposal in Egypt. Education, wealth, family tied with Pharaoh. Even though he's a Hebrew, I understand that. That boy had everything. He says, you know what? Let me get a good picture of this. I'd rather go walk in the desert for 40 years than stay here in Egypt. That's an Old Testament saying. You're a New Testament saint in the body of Christ. I wish to God I'd have that viewpoint more often. I'm not going to bother taking it, but doesn't the Bible say, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world? If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, is not a problem, is of the world. We quote that, but the reality is, 
we can't wait to get done with church. We can't get, wait to get done with Bible reading because there's something better on the internet. There's something better on TV. There's something better at work. And are you kidding me as a saved person? You, you, you're, folks, you're going blind. You don't even see it. But thank God the Lord says, come see me. I've got some eye salve that will help you with that blindness. But you know what happens? You let them stay outside the door. I want to come into Laodicea. I want to come in and cure them from being naked and destitute and poor. And I want, to, I want to come in. But you won't let me in. So I'm not going to go where I'm not welcomed. The Lord's such a gentleman. You don't want the Lord. The Lord says, okay, see the judgment seat. You don't want me? I'll be seeing you soon. Oh, he's not like that. He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh. God laughs at people. There might be a little bit of laughter. But I, told, I told you, and you went that way, and you still did that. And I warned you about Woodhay and Stubble, and I warned you about Lost Across, and I told him to tell you that, and he told you, and you still see ya. Loss of reward. Still a child of God. Still a journey of secure. But you're blind in your journey down here in this earth. Spirit, I, folks, you see perfectly right now. You see 2020, maybe even better than 2020. But spiritually, you're blind in a bat. Well, go and see the one that has the eye salve. Man, he'll put that eye salve on you. You'll start seeing things the way the Lord sees them. But there's that battle between the world and the flesh and, and your Savior. Go to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, please. 1 Timothy 6. We are having the Lord's Supper today. I did not preach in this for the Lord's Supper, but it's good for you and I. In fact, one of, the, one of the best things about the Lord's Supper is we're to examine ourselves. We're to take stock of our walk with the Lord. That's part of the whole thing in 1 Corinthians 11. The Bible says this in 1 Timothy 6, 6. But God this with contempt is great gain. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us there be content. That's just an absolutely vicious verse, man. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and the snare and the many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, Flee these things and fall after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And then he goes on to say, fight the good fight of faith. How can you leave the faith and drown yourself in destruction and perdition if you're not saved to start with? Saved people love money more than they love Jesus Christ. Yep. Saved people love the things of this world more than they love Jesus Christ. Don't tell me you don't because it's happened in my life. And if it happens to me, I know it happens to you because there's no temptation taking you, but such as common man. We all battle with that old man, that old world, and the draw of it. Folks, you can't go down the highway without seeing a billboard. You need this. You need that. You'll, you take this. Now, I, I saw this crazy thing uh, on the TV about beet juice. Beet juice is the new, you know, thing. I'm like, beet juice. I hated beets when my mom served them. Because we got them in that stupid can that weighed about 156 pounds with that dark purple looking juice. It was that's not what a beet looks like, Mom. I don't care. Eat it. And whenever you heard the can over, you knew the beets were coming. And I was about ready to beat it out of town. But I'm like, I saw this ad for beet juice. Beet juice helps your uh, helps your heart. And listen, you should take care of yourself. But when God says it's over, it's over, son. Don't get sucked into all those crazy stuff. If you have this skin condition, this skin condition will work for you. Have whiter teeth. Eat a piece of chalk. Something, I mean, come on, man. Folks, whatever, you're, whatever you want, this world seems to be able to find a way to get it right at you. Mm. Oh, I need that. You never needed it before you saw it. Mm. Only in America do we pay to have storage bins. Upstairs, it's called the attic. 
and those big tall plastic things that can hold a million puzzles and a few other things. So <laughs> that's our, that's our, that's our, that's our, our, but we do try to clean it out. And you know, we find some bodies up there and some other stuff. <laughs> and you know, uh, there's a mastodon up there and there's a few other things that are probably worth some money. But I mean, did we really need that stuff? I thought I needed it at the time. You know why? I just drew my flesh in and appealed to my flesh because you know what? I was blind to what I really needed, having food and raiment, lest there would be content. Well, oh, that's impossible. You can't. You, you need a car now. Look, 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 hold on. Take the spirit of the passage and the practicality of it. What he's telling you. There's the will to be rich, and then there's having food and raiment. Are you satisfied with what God gives you, or are you going to go pursue what you want as a saved person? If you are doing that one, you're blind. Your eyesight's leaving. You're, they're getting to. That's Isaac. Isaac's one of the greatest men of life. If it can happen to him, I'm sure it can happen to you and I. Go with me back to uh, Genesis 48. Genesis 48, please. Genesis 48. Genesis 48. Genesis 48, verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him uh, two sons of Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me, and said unto me, Behold, I will, take, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, these are Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon shall be mine. And thy issue, which thou begettest after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren and their inheritance. And as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and I buried her there in this way of Ephrath, the same as Bethlehem. That's type number 1.7 million, Brother Bird. Yeah. <laughs> Verse number 8. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Whose are these? And Joseph said unto his father, These are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God has showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out like the grandkids three. I thought you were dead, son. Having a good time. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel, look at this, that's Jacob. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was first born. Do you get the picture here? Joseph takes his sons like this. Johnny, you're Jacob right now. <laughs> he walks towards you. You know what you do with Jacob? Joseph knows who the blessings should go to. What does Jacob do? You old schemer. Boy, scheming dies hard, doesn't it? Connive and treachery. God gave you a new name, called you Israel. A prince that has power with God in 3228. And now you're still at the end of your life shucking and jiving. You know what he's blind to, folks? Practical application for you and I? He's blind to the fact that deceit in your own life will come out publicly and personally one way or another. Let's say that, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Uh, you ever cheat on your taxes? This one's going to be a hard one for me. I'll tell you right now, it's, it's, I can't even believe anyone's to say it. You ever slow down when you see a state trooper? Yeah. <laughs> you old Jacob, you. Mm, boy. Look at what, Lord, did you know I went out on the street preached four times this week? Yeah, and you broke the speed limit 15 times, and you slowed down when you saw the cop 14 on 15 times. 
the other time you prayed to me that I'd rescue from not getting a ticket. It's that Jacob's eyes, he's going dim, he can't see, and he's still, he's still playing the trick bag. He's still hiding the queen. Of all the people that should be honest in all their doings, it's you and I. People ought to know us for being honest, forthright, not double-tongued in what we do and say. That's hard, man. Because you know what we have in our society? We call things little white lies. I just shaded the truth. I didn't tell you everything, Guido, because I didn't want to hurt your feelings. That's a lie. It's deception, Jacob. You're still doing the same thing you were doing as a kid. God gave you a new name. God gave you your son back. The son you made a coat of many colors for. The son you loved. And you're still at the end of your life, still trying to pull the wool over somebody's eyes. How about you today, Christian? You lost your spiritual eyesight and you're still trying to trick back everybody? Still trying to cheat from the boss or steal a little here, steal a little there? I can tell right now, every one of us has done it in one way, shape, or another, but that should not be the testimony, or that should not be the passed away of our lives. And if it is, you make it right, and you go back, and you you pick it up from there. I can't, I mean, you, have you ever read the end of Jacob's life, what he says in front of Pharaoh? Few and evil have been the days of my pilgrimage. That's all you got to say? You met with God? You saw a ladder up to heaven? You, you got your kid back? Is that all you got to say? Yeah, if you and evil. You know why? Because you've been tricking and deceiving everybody all your life. And it's hardened your stinking heart, pal. You know what it says over in Hebrews 3? It says, the deceitfulness of sin <coughs> hardens your heart. You don't think it's doing anything to you, but it is doing something to you every time you do it. And it tricks you into thinking, oh, my heart can stay soft through that. Bible says otherwise. Go with me. I'll give you a couple of these. I know you're very happy to see these, so I figured I'd spend some time on them. Romans 12. Do you remember a man named Judas? What was Judas known as? I know he's the son of perdition. I understand all that. But didn't the, doesn't the Bible call him the traitor? You know what a traitor is? Benedict Arnold. You infiltrate. Secrets. Get all in tight. But then you turn coat. You're really, you're a double agent. You're working for the other side. We got Christian double agents out there. Excuse me, saved double agents out there. They want to play both sides of the fence. And the Lord's like, uh, Laodicea is like that. They think they see, but they're really blind. They need some eyesight. But you know what? You're neither hot nor cold. I hate that. I want to, I'm spewing you out of my mouth. You make me sick that you're still playing the tricky game, the deceitful game over here, but then you're trying to stand up for my name over here. I hate that, man. We don't think God's really like that. He really is, folks. Look at the Bible says to me in Romans 12. Good old-fashioned Pauline doctrine. I like it. I like it all, but man, this stuff just hits, it hits like a ton of bricks, man. The Bible says this is verse number 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, giving the hospitality. We could shut it down right there and say, wow, Lord's Supper, I need to get those things right and start doing them. That's brutal. You can't do those without doing the first two verses, which is present your bodies of what? Okay. Yeah, man. A little bit of Bible goes on to say. We're talking about deceitfulness and how that manifests itself personally and publicly. The Bible says this, uh, uh, verse number 14, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of just those who are saved. Be borrow, borrow their chainsaw. Sorry, that's a different version. Provide things honest in the sight of all Men. Lord, they're not saved. I can take them for, to the cleaners. All men's all men. In fact, it's over in Galatians 6 as well. It's all through your New Testament. 
All men is all men, saved or lost. We're talking about the devil. I'm supposed to be honest and so aren't you. I'm not supposed to be a Jacob and deceive people publicly or personally. Because that's where it starts first. You deceive your own self. Thinking you really see where we started. And you don't really see. I have no problem, Lord. No problem. Lord's Supper. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Mm, you better not take the Lord's Supper. I better not take that Lord's Supper lightly. God does make you sick. God does take brethren home. It does affect other members of the body of Christ because you don't discern the Lord's body when you take it unworthily. Self-examination. Maybe you're, maybe you're a Jacob today. Maybe you're, you know what? Maybe you're a Mrs. Jacob today. Well, that's why for men, you know. No, maybe you're a Mrs. Jacob today. Maybe you plot and scheme things yourself. Maybe you're a, a female. You're a Jacob S. Get it right, man. I can't change now. Shh, that's the devil talking and your old man talking. You can change through the power of the Spirit of God. Right. You just don't want to. We're comfortable in the old man. Too comfortable. Go with me over to 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. Please. 1 Thessalonians 5. Look at verse 14 with me. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14. These verses are absolutely... 514. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, support the weak, be patient toward uh oh. All men. That man, that is just, I'd rather not see that right now, but it's true. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever fall that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. Over at Colossians 3, don't turn there. He says, lie not one to another. Mm -hmm. We ought not to lie to... Of, of all the people we ought not to lie to, we shouldn't lie to anybody. But we should not be able to... We should not be lying to one another. Brother Bert, that was a great Sunday school message, by the way. I thought that. <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. I mean, if you don't have... Don't say it. Yeah. You, you, you're like Jacob. You're, you're blind and don't even see that you're a deceiver personally and publicly. You don't think Jacob's actions impact other people. But you don't thank God the Lord said, come to me and get some eyes out. I can, take, I can help you see that self-deceit, that trigger you've got in your heart. You know what? We can get rid of it. We can root it out with it. I, you know what? i got a really good scalpel. It's called the AB-1611. It'll cut it right out of you. If you let me. If you let me in the door. you got to let me in. Go with me back to uh, Job. Go to Job. How many are these? Just a couple more. It's not fun stuff to preach, man. It's not fun stuff to get eviscerated when you're reading through it, man. Again and again. You know when you say to your children, how many times do I have to tell you? And then the Lord says, ha, 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 ha. I love hearing that when you say it to your kids, and I say the same thing to you. Dumb, dumb head. That's his name for me. That's my new name right now. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that funny, Jennifer? I mean, <laughs> Job, Job 17. Job 17. Job 17, verse number one says this My breath is corrupt, my days are extinct, the graves are ready for me. Are there not mockers with me, and doth not mine eye continue in their provocation? Lay down now. Put me in a surety with thee. Who is he that will strike hands with me? For thou hast hid their heart from understanding. Therefore shalt thou not exalt them. Verse 5. He that speaketh flattery to his friends, even the eyes of his children shall fail. He hath made me also a byword of the people. And aforetime I was as a tabret. In other words, Job has gone from the top of the mountain to the lowest of the low. I was the voice of people. People sat with me. I sat in the gate, gave advice to people, and now these guys come and are exposing me, and they're, they're, they're making a mockery of me. Look at the Bible. It was on the same verse 7. Mine eye also is dim <laughs> by reason of sorrow, and all my members are as a shadow. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 15. This one is you're walking, you're blind, and you don't see that you're actually walking in defeat and depression. Job is a great man. He's one of the three best in Ezekiel 14, 14. It's Noah, Daniel, and Job. Job is the guy that the Lord says in James 5, you know the patience of Job. 
I mean, Job is a, when when you hear even lost people say stuff. So, what do they say? I'm going through the trials of, or I'm being tested. Like even lost people know what this man went through. This man is a great man. God even said, "One that fears God and shoes evil." I, I mean, Satan. Have you, have you ever taken a look at this guy? What kind of discussion must have that been up there? And the Lord's the one that points out and says, oh, "Man, he's he, he's a, he's a great dude." He's a great dude. And then here we are in chapter 17, and Job is like, all these guys are mocking me. They're making fun of me. My, my life is a wreck. I had a great reputation in the gate. I was a man esteemed. I was rich. I was one of the richest men in the East. I had, look at all, I had all my kids. I had, I had everything. And now look at me. I got nothing. 1 Corinthians 15. I want to encourage you in this one, man. Like I've been encouraging all morning is that, you know what? You don't have to stay blind. Do you know what you have in Jesus Christ, folks? Do you really know? The Bible says this in verse number 50. 1550, 1 Corinthians. Now I say, brother, that, the, uh, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither the corruption, inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all, uh, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Do you know sin and death have no power over you right now? Do you know what you have in Christ Jesus that because he's alive, you're alive? Do you know because he has the keys to hell and death, you're not going to hell and death is not going to take the hold on you like it does other people? You know when a lost person goes home to glory, we don't sorrow as others? You know why? You have victory forever in Jesus Christ. It's because he's alive and gave you a book and promised it. You can shout in the lowest of times of your life. Job gets depressed. He can't see. His eyes get dim. Look at everybody making fun of me. Look at my life. Look at what I had. Look at what I did. Is this what happens to people who serve God? Is this what goes on in people's lives that are dedicated to God? Is this what? Is this, is this how it is? I mean, I, 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 I was a tap. I was the guy that, and now they don't even come to me for any of my soul. I mean, what has happened is he lost his vision that God always gives the victory. And God, for you and I, has given us the victory. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 2. Boy, you're reading 2 Corinthians 2. The Bible says this in verse number 12. 2 Corinthians 2, 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and the door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Folks, triumph means victory. It doesn't mean I have to mully grub around all my life. Folks, it's not about you. It's about Him. Right. It's not about your life and your fancy settings. and your. It's not about... It's about Jesus Christ. He bought you with a price. And He can do whatever He wants with you and I. I don't like that like you. I don't like it either because my flesh right now is saying, don't say that. Don't say that because you know what? You love yourself. But it needs to be said, it's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. And He can do whatever He wants with you. He bought you with the most unbelievable price in the universe, His shed blood. You owe Him and I owe Him everything. You heard it in Sunday school, Philemon. He took every sin, everything I'd ever think, say, or do on Him on that cross for now, for all eternity. Amen. That's called triumph, man. That's called victory. You know what you do? You shout a little bit. Amen. And they kind of broken up. I'm not going to hell. Praise the Lord. And I deserve it. In fact, I deserve to go to hell right today, as a matter of fact. But I'm not because of the triumph I have and the victory I have in Christ. Amen. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I know you don't like it because you're blind. And you don't see things God's way. Well, why don't you go get to my staff? But you'd have to open the door and let him in. And let him minister to you. Just like you invited him in when you wanted him to save you. You know what it says over in Proverbs 24, 16? A just man falleth 
seven times. Well, what's he do? Rise up again. Get up. I said it a few weeks ago. Get up. Get, you, you, you're going to get knocked down. You're going to fall down. You're going to stumble. Get up. Stop wallowing in your self-pity. You've got triumph in Jesus Christ. Get up. You don't know what I'm going through. He does. And he gave you the victory. Get up. Lamentations 5. Last one, Lamentations 5. Lamentations. A cheerful book before you go to bed. I wonder if Lamentations is about the rainbow. <laughs> what a title for a book. Lamentations. If God couldn't be more specific about what it's going to entail. <laughs> Why don't you just name it happiness? I don't know. Happy book. <laughs> it's Lamentations, man. But it's actually pretty good. I know it's dealing with Israel and the tribulation period. I understand that doctrinally. I know where we're at. I'm trying to get some practical draw out of it this morning. Look what the Bible says in verse number 7. Our fathers have sinned and are not. And we have borne their iniquities. Servants have ruled over us. Talking about Israel. There is none that could deliver us out of their hand. Verse number 9. We gat our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. They ravished the women in Zion and the maids in the cities of Judah. Princes are hanged up by their hand. The faces of elders were not honored. It's a rough go in Zion right now. They took the young men to grind, and the children fell into the wood. The elders have ceased from the gate, the young men from their music. The joy of our heart has ceased. Our dance has turned into mourning. Our, uh, the crown has fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. How did it start in verse 7, folks? Our fathers have sinned. Woe unto us, personal, that we have sinned. For this, our heart is faint. For these things... Our eyes are dim. The last thing I'd like to say this morning on this thing, go to 1 John 1, is that undealt with sin in your life will lead to loss of joy, happiness, and reward. I thought my sins were washed away at the cross, preacher. They were, 100%. But you have something called a fellowship with your Father after you're saved. You can walk in darkness, or you can walk in light. You're, you're supposed to be children of light. We are children of light according to Ephesians 5. But you, you wade back into the pool of darkness. You don't lose your sonship. You don't lose your salvation. You lose fellowship with your Heavenly Father. The Bible says this in 1 John 1. I know, it's, I understand the doctrinal implication of this as well. But there, this is you, you can't beat this when he calls you the sons of God, chapter 3. I mean, I, I get it, man, with the, the tribulation plan. But look at this, man. Verse number 1. That which, uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and showing to you that eternal life, which is with the Father, was manifested unto us. That which, that which we have seen and heard, declare unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with the Son, Jesus Christ. That's great. Look at, watch. And these things write me unto you that your joy may be full. What did they lose in Lamentations? Their joy. What did they lose over Lamentations? The crown. Why? Because of sin. Look at the Bible goes on to say. This says the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie, not, uh, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, it's a choice to walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Self-deception, Jacob. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any, and if any man sin, we have advocate with, Jesus, uh, with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sins. We already have that at the cross. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. They need to get saved so they can enjoy that with the Father. What do you and I have today? I have fellowship with the Father. Through Jesus Christ. But I can choose to walk in darkness with my life. I can choose to walk in the old man. You know what? That's undealt with sin. Don't. I, I, I'm going to show you Pauline Epistle in a minute. So you don't think I'm just going over first John cherry picking something here. I'm going to tell you right now that there is. you pick up sin in your life. So don't I, folks. Don't you sit here and tell me you haven't sinned since you've been saved. You make him a liar. And you've what? Deceived yourself. You're blind. 
that sin that's not dealt with, Father, you know what? I ask you, Father, say that I don't need to have. Would you please take the Word of God and wash that out of my heart and my mind? So I can get back in fellowship with you. Because I know you're not in darkness. In fact, you don't traffic in the stuff I traffic in. But the only way I can walk with you is if I walk in the light. And that book, thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light on my path. Every one of us has trouble with that sin thing after we get saved. I know you are redeemed for all eternity. I know my standing. But you know what changes every day? Your state. Walk with the Lord. Walk in the flesh. That does happen. Go with me over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 5. You can't say this sin doesn't affect your reward and your joy and all that. You just read it does. But look over at 1 Timothy. Uh, in Coloss without going there, Colossians 3 says, you've got to be careful lest you lose your reward and your inheritance. Why? Because of things you did in your body. Second, we just finished up eight weeks on the judgment seat of Christ. You can lose rewards from stuff you did in your body. And you lose joy and fellowship. But you don't see that because you're blind. Oh, who cares? Judgment seat. I hear it talk about it. who really cares about that. I don't know. You're blind, man. You need some eyes to have. Look at the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5. Pick it up with me in verse number uh, 17. Let the elders that are real well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in, work, uh, in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that tread out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. Against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Then that sin, that's the elder, in the context, then a sin rebuked before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man. That's the transference of authority and all those things going on in the, in the church. In the assembly, lay hands on no man. Neither be look at this. Neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. You get rid of your sin down here before it meets you up there. You say, well, Judgment Seat of Christ is not about sin. That sin affects your rewards and your joy at that place called the Judgment Seat of Christ. You just read even in Lamentations the picture. <clears throat> our crowns fall from our head. Why? Because our fathers sinned. But then we sinned. And we also lost joy. It's about that fellowship with your Savior. If you don't, I, I don't know. We're going to have the Lord supper right now. Are you in fellowship with your Father right now? Oh, I would say, are you walking with the Lord like he'd want you to walk? Or are you blind to the fact that, man, there's some things I'm out of step with him on. I, I, need to, I need to examine myself, get them right, with the Lord best I can, take up my cross, enjoy the Lord's Supper, and I, I'm, I, I'm, gonna leave, I'm leaving those things. I'm not picking them back up again. I don't have a problem with altar calls, folks. I understand, well, you know, you go to the altar and you just end up doing the same thing. Well, that's just a defeatist mentality. How about the millions of people that went to the altar and got things right and never picked it up again? How about the folks in Acts 19 that came and took their curious arts and their pictures and all that and burned them at 50,000 talents of silver? Do you think they went back? No, they publicly came out and said, we've had enough of this foolishness. We're burning everything, our books, our arts, everything. We're getting rid of it, and we're not going back. Call, you can have a prayer life where you say, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to think like this anymore. I don't want to act like this anymore. I don't want to talk like this anymore. Lord, would you change me? Can you help me to walk in fellowship and walk in the light as you're in the light? Because I don't want those sins to meet me where they've affected my rewards. I know we're going a long time. I, I'm serious. I don't mean to go to Isaiah 32, but I can't leave you without the remedy. So let me give you the eye salve. Let me give you the eye salve. Isaiah 32. Brother Jonathan asked me to go longer so you didn't have to get up here first. <laughs> I'd say 32. I'd say 32. Don't look how long you go to turn this year. <laughs> <You're more laughs> than that. No, it does <laughs> 32. 32. We're going to have a bingo light switch up here. A yes. thermometer. Oh, 32. One. For those of you who know what a thermometer is in the church, you know what I mean when I say that. Yeah. 32.1, the Bible says this, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment, and a man shall be as a as an hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest. It's actually talking about the second coming. And a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, in the shadow of a great rock and a weary land. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim. 
and the eyes of them that hear shall hurt you. You know, you know remedy number one? Have an expected expectation that Jesus Christ is coming back. That King is coming back. Amen. That's one of the eye salves for you to get out of the deceitfulness and the, and all the, all the all the ones where all these men were dim. Their eyes were dim and couldn't see. Number one, get your focus on Jesus Christ coming back. The King is coming to rule and righteousness. He's going to be covert and all, but He's coming for me in the clouds to take me out of here. And if I die, ask for the presence of the Lord to be present. I mean, folks, that's a great joy to me. That's a happiness. I don't like the suffering anymore. You're down there with the pain or any of that stuff. But I'm looking forward to seeing my Savior. It keeps my eyesight from not going dim. His eyes won't be dim. Go over me to Deuteronomy 34. You guys know this one. I don't even have to even go here. Deuteronomy 34. Well, why are you? Because the food's getting cold. Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34. This is pretty cool. Deuteronomy 34, verse number 1. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab on the mountains of Nebo, the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead and Dan, and all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, unto the utmost sea in the south, and the south of the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees and the Zoar. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which is swear to Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, thou, but thou shalt not go over Thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Beor. But no man knoweth of his sepulchre to this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. 120 years old, and he didn't have to go see Jen Bonoy at the ophthalmologist. 120 years old. You say, well, what, what's, what's the one here, preacher? Over in Hebrews 3, it says that Moses was faithful in all his house. Look for the Lord, number one, and it'll keep your eyes from getting dim. That's some good eye salve. Number two, be faithful in whatever God calls you to be faithful. Did Moses slip up? Yup, he got up. Did Moses do stupid stuff? Yup, and he got up. And God says, I know you smoked the rock. I know you're not. But you know what? One day, Moses, I'm going to have you come back down here and preach against the Antichrist. So just hold your four. Dessert's coming. But right now, you're not going to be able to see it. But I'll tell you what. You're going to die without your natural force abated. 120 years old, and the guy's out running three miles a day. Doesn't have to go to the eye doctor. You know what? He's faithful in everything God told him to be faithful in. That's pretty cool. Second Peter. Second Peter. Know the Lord's coming back. Be faithful in what He's called you to do. And check this out, Second Peter. Why don't you just say this at the beginning? We could have been done with it. I know, I know, man. I know. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm feeling it. Second Peter one. Second Peter chapter one, verse number one says, Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us and the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of, our, and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to the light of God and the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, those great and precious promises, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, Knowledge, temperance, and temperance, patience, and of patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was once purged from his old sins. Your last eye sat right here is you need to go. You, you were saved. Don't forget your, what the Lord did for you when he saved you. But also, after he saved you, he wants you to grow. You're not supposed to sit still and sit idle. What are you supposed to add? You just had an unbelievable list. Charity, brother kindness, virtue, diligence, patience. You don't just sit like a bubble. Like, oh, I'm saved. You need to get under a Bible preaching teeth. I don't know. I'm not, that's not church promote. Find one you can get along with. And get underneath the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And grow. It's not just about witnessing. It's your personal growth with the Lord. 
and you add to your faith all those things. If you don't, the Bible says you're blind. I didn't say it. God said it. Well, I'm saved, brother. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're a saved blind person. So God gave you all those, and then he said, here's some eyes set up for you to get your sight back. Look for my coming. Be faithful until I come for you, whatever I cause you to do. And continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It'll, it'll help you get the, the fuzziness out of those eyes and the dimness that's there. And start seeing the way of things the Lord would have you seen. Brother Guido, pray for us, and then we'll get the Lord's Supper going up here. If you could, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the privilege of being here this morning. We thank you for the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. We thank you for the blessings of Sunday school and for church. Lord, that we can have our sight restored on a given day by walking with you, Lord, and getting in the Word. Yeah. Thank you for the fellowship of believers here. Yeah. That we stand on the Word of God. That we're frail human beings. We fail. Yeah. We'll always come back to you, Lord. And I hope, hope that you would help us all search our hearts before we have the Lord's Supper. And to bless the preaching that's coming this afternoon. Just yes. quicken everybody who gets behind that puppet. Lord, that we would always have ears that hear and eyes that see. We just love you, Lord, and give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 11, we'll go, we'll go right into the Lord's Supper, and then we'll have a few minutes for examination on that. I want to read the passage, and we'll, we'll do that. Have a couple guys come up and do the, the blood of the grave and the, and the bread. First Corinthians 11. Start with me in verse number 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat, to drink in, or despise the church of God? And shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. We had given thanks, he break it, said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This is this cup is the New Testament of my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. For as often we can do it as much as we want or as little as we want. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you can show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That's what I said earlier, that has an effect on the body of Christ. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means they're, they're dead. That's, that's a negative effect of, of taking the Lord's Supper incorrectly, improperly, unexamining your, or not examining yourself, and getting, the, getting what you need to get right. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned of the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. That means wait for one another. The Bible says, if any man hunger, let him eat at home. That ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest shall set in when they come. So the Lord's Supper, given through the following epistle, is not the same, obviously, as the Lord's Passover. That's the model it's drawn off of, and going back to Exodus 12. We practice the Lord's Supper. If you're saved and you're baptized, you can take it. I don't care if you're from another church. <laughs> if you're washed in the blood, you've been baptized. Partake. It's for you. But before we do that, as is customary, and I believe it's a Bible custom, we need to examine ourselves. So if you want to take a few minutes to pray where you're at, or turn around in your chair and get on knees and pray, whatever, we'll take a few minutes to pray. Set some things right with the Lord, and if you need to make something right with another brother or sister in Christ, please feel free to do so. It's biblically right.
let's uh, let's do that for a few moments, then we'll we'll partake of the Lord's Supper. The Bible says this in verse 23, For I received the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and given thanks. He broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do remember to me. We pray for the widow and then distribute. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. The body that was broken on that cross, we break bread now. Later in the day, when we meet in that fellowship, that you bless these proceedings, that you calm our hearts from all the cares and nonsense out in the world. Amen. Please bless us today, Father, for the meeting people. Christ's name. Amen.
Brother John, I think we're going forward with. Bible says, verse number 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, and he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, this do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to, to be here and just read your word and just to examine ourselves and come your blood. And just thank you for that, that blood that you provided for us, Lord, that we do have a way to to just come to you and, and be cleansed from, from everything and just I pray that you help us to honor you and in all we do Lord and we can just re remember your blood on on this day but every day every gift of a day that you give us we pray that we just be with the rest of this service Verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, and you show the Lord's death till they come. Amen. <laughs> he didn't stay dead. He's alive for everyone. Samuel, we'll just sing it up. One verse of 523. Good. Don't pray. Or in the warehouse. 523. On the first. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to meet.
this morning around your word. Thank you for the blood of your son. The Lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. Thank you for that body on that tree. I thank you, Father, that he's alive and doing really well right now. And I cannot wait to see him. And I pray that's the, the hope of all my brothers and sisters in Christ in this assembly and throughout the world that we would we would just, Father, we would desire to see him above all else. And we would fashion our lives according to that blessed hope. Thank you for the opportunity to have some food now, Father. Please prepare our hearts uh, for the preaching to come, the real spiritual food later. Father, Father, I do pray you bless the food now. Thank you for the folks that made it, and have labored over it. Thank you for the money and the jobs you've given to us to provide this food. Father, it comes from you. It doesn't come from anywhere else, and I thank you for it. Amen. I ask you bless now on this time, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.